different. Okay, so let me introduce uh, group number four. Um, or, or how do I orange yeah. yeah. Orange ethanol. Original. Yes. Something like that. Yeah. Yes, Incorporated. I can do that part. Yeah. Yes. Production of bioethanol from orange peel waste. Yeah. There you go. All right. Hi guys, um, thank you all for coming out and listening to us present. We're really excited to talk about this rather novel idea. Um, so, like Professor Webster said, we are going to talk about the production of ethanol from um, orange peel waste, and we are Orange Ethanol Inc. Um, so, the team, uh, my name is Amar. My name is Joseph. And I'm Amy. So, a little bit of an overview of what we're going to talk about today. Um, first, we're going to talk about sort of why we decided to do this um, and talk about um, the economic demand that'll be in the market overview sort of section, um, and then we'll talk about the proposal, is, which is what we're going to, uh, what we plan on doing. Um, and after that, will be the process overview. We'll we'll get into the technical details about how our process works, um, and then we'll talk about the economic analysis, where we'll um, you know, discuss the feasibility and viability of our um, overall project, and then we'll round it out with the EHNS and conclusions or in, and recommendations. So, get excited. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the future of energy um, and what that entails. So um, the world population is expected to reach about 8 billion people by 2025. And what that means is that there is going to be a huge increase in demand for fuel. Um, everybody needs to drive cars, everybody needs to use oil for other purposes. Um, so we're expecting you know, an increase in demand. But the problem with that is that the fuel that we're using is limited, it's non-renewable oil, it's running out. It might not seem like it because of the recent you know, increase in oil production, but eventually that will go down. That's not sustainable at all. Um, and then coupled with that is that worldwide, um, governments are increasing energy regulations. What they want is they want more efficient energy production. They want more eco-friendly energy resources. Um, and one of those things is bioethanol, you know, producing ethanol from bio sources. Um, and the major product there is corn-based bioethanol. Um, but that also has another problem, um, and that is that it causes a strain upon the food supply. Um, so all four of these points right here, they lead to one major like, problem that needs to be solved, which is that we need an alternative fuel source that will solve all these problems and provide us um, with energy. So let's talk a little bit about what's happening right now. Right now, we do have bioethanol, but it's being produced from corn. Um, and when this was first presented, this was seen as the solution. This is, we have it, guys. We are going to make uh, renewable energy. Um, it's going to be green, and it's not going to have any problems at all. But that's not exactly what ended up happening. Um, one of the major problems is that because we are using corn, we end up taking that corn out of the food supply, which causes an increase in the price of corn, which makes it inaccessible for a lot of people worldwide, which is kind of not acceptable, that we can't let that happen. Um, and so, you know, and like I said earlier on, the world population is increasing, which means that we'll need to grow more corn, and we'll need to take more and more uh, corn outside of the food supply, make it more inaccessible for a lot more people, and that's just a problem that's gonna snowball and, you know, make even more problems. Um, so the next problem with um, corn is that it's a water-intensive crop, so it uses a lot of water um, and because we need to grow more of it to feed our you know, um, demand, we're going to use more and more water, and it becomes simply unsustainable. And uh, another thing is that uh, corn, growing corn uses a lot of insecticides and pesticides, and all of that ends up running off into groundwater, and it um, you know, contaminates it, which is an environmental concern for the future. So that's another problem with using corn uh, to generate ethanol. ethanol. And then finally, the overall process itself has a very high carbon footprint. It was seen as a green energy sort of thing, but it was actually not that um, green. It does not produce as much energy as um, is put in to make the ethanol. So um, all of these problems lead to one thing, and that is that we need an alternative to make ethanol. Um, and so that's what we're going to talk about later on. So that's sort of the why we're doing this. Now we're going to talk a little bit about economic demand. Um, and show that there is a demand for this. Um, so currently, the bioethanol market is about 14 billion gallons uh, per year. This is a tenfold increase from 2000. Um, and like I said before, 
Um, there's increasing regulation to uh, make more fuel efficient um, cars and stuff. So uh, 16 states have mandated that the fuel that we use in a car, right now it's a 10% ethanol, 90% gasoline mix. They want to increase that to 15% ethanol, 85% um, gasoline and that's going to increase like we're going to need billions and billions of more gallons of ethanol to make up for that um, demand so um, another uh, thing is that Congress has also pushed for um, increase in bioethanol production they uh, passed a act in 2007 the Energy Independence and Security Act um, which wanted to increase bioethanol production to about 36 billion gallons per year by 2022. Right now we're at 14 billion gallons. There's a huge, huge um, opportunity right there. And 21 billion gallons of this um, 36 billion gallon needs to come from non-corn starch sources. So it cannot use corn because they realize the problems with corn. Um, and so most of this production should come from cellulosic and advanced uh, biofuels such as switchgrass or wood chips or agricultural wastes. Um, so, like I said, there's a huge opportunity here that we plan on investing into and, um, you know, uh, we're going to uh, basically use this window of opportunity to enter the market. Speaking about the market, um, now, th because we're a startup, uh, it might seem a bit of a daunting task to enter this market where there are major players, um, but it actually is not that daunting. Uh, the market is pretty fragmented. Um, there's no major barriers to enter it because there are about over 120 companies within the market, which means that no one company has like a dominating uh, monopoly. Um, and there are actually no major players in the cellulosic derived ethanol market either. Um, and so um, what we plan on doing is we plan on producing our ethanol and then we plan on selling it to um, ExxonMobil or Shell or any other gasoline providers who will mix it and then they will sell it to um, consumers as well. So, what are we proposing? We are proposing is that we will use orange peel waste as a feedstock to produce bioethanol in a large-scale industrial process as a sustainable alternative to fossil fuels and food-based biofuels. This is our proposal. Um, and what we plan on doing is we have a sort of a two-fold approach. Um, we plan, to, uh, plan on using um, a pilot scale plant of about 500,000 gallons. We will build that um, and we'll implement our technology in there. Um, and the reason we'll do th we're doing this is because it minimizes risks. There's not a lot of capital investment going into this. Um, and this will also allow us to sort of debug any technical problems that we run into. Um, we can fix them on this scale before we go commercial. Um, it's, less, uh, it's a lot less um, economic worry to, uh, things to worry about. And then also this will be a proof of concept to sort of say we have been able to demonstrate at the pilot at the scale, now we can go up to commercial scale. Um, and then plant B um, is the commercial scale uh, 10 million gallon plant that we will scale up to after we prove that we can um, incorporate this technology at the pilot plant level. Um, and throughout our presentation we will refer to them as plant A and plant B. And we have done an economic analysis of both of them to show that both are um, potentially feasible as well. Um, this right here is a picture I will explain on the next slide. It looks like an empty waste yard, but it'll become something more important. Um, so our location, we plan on locating in Florida. Florida is a hotbed for the energy industry. There's a lot of incentives from the government to support renewable energy um, development there. There's tax uh, credits going on, there's a lot of grants available, there's 11.3 million grants available for renewable biofuels um, as of this year. Um, and we plan on using this, uh, you know, all these grants to help us build our plant. So that's why one of the reasons we'll be, we will be locating in Florida. And another reason is that Florida is a major orange juice producer. So if we're in Florida, we can get our raw material, orange peel waste, right there. Um, and we actually plan on um, teaming up with Florida's natural orange juice. Um, we're buying a plot of land right next to them, this right here. Um, we plan on buying a plot of land right next to them, and they will be giving us their orange peel waste, and we will be using that directly. Um, so there will be no transportation costs. There's, um, like I said, there's a lot of incentives in terms of rebates and tax credits, and that's why we plan on locating ourselves in Florida.
All right, so I'm just gonna give a quick overview of the process of this flow diagram, and then I'll dive into each step more later. Um, so coming into the whole process, obviously we have our orange peels. Uh, that gets fed into a jet cooker for a pretreatment step, uh, along with acid and steam. Uh, coming out of that, we can also isolate a byproduct, limonene, uh, and the rest of the material gets fed into a bioreactor, um, where the fermentation and the production of ethanol actually happens. Uh, and the ethanol needs to be concentrated and purified, so we have a distillation column, and then we have a dryer as our final purification step to yield our fuel grade ethanol. So like I said, the first step is pretreatment. Uh, and since there isn't or aren't really any real regulations around orange peels in the industry, since it's not exactly an orange peel industry, uh, the first step is just to wash them and get rid of any major impurities, as well as slice them to kind of standardize them in a way that won't affect uh, downstream processing. Um, after that, they're fed into a jet cooker, like that one right there. Uh, into the jet cooker also comes steam to elevate the temperature and pressure up to about 120 Celsius and 15 to 20 PSIG. What that essentially does is it explodes the peels, breaking down their physical structure. Um, and we also treat it at this point with uh, sulfuric acid, which is strong acid. So the pH lowers down to about one or two, and that provides a more chemical means of degrading the overall structure. Coming out of the jet cooker, we have two streams. One is a slurry mix that's fed to the fermentation reactor. Uh, the other is a vapor mix, uh, which will be the d stream. So in that, in that vapor stream, a uh, major component is d lemonine so that's that compound right there. Um, this is found in orange peels as well as other citrus peels. Uh, you can probably guess the name might come from lemons or lime. Um, and it's removed here for two major reasons. One is that it's a major byproduct of this process. Uh, it can be recovered and sold, especially looking at the cosmetic industry. It's used widely for fragrances. It gives that nice citrusy feel. Uh, other reasons might be more important is that it can have uh, or it can inhibit downstream enzyme activity. And so by removing it here, uh, we're able to increase our overall process yield. And so the way it's removed is that the vapor mix is condensed and then sent through what's essentially a chromatography column packed with activated carbon and raw cotton. Uh, due to the hydrophobic nature of lemonine, it gets removed and we can sell it as a byproduct. The other stream coming out of the jet cooker is a slurry mix, uh, which is sent to the bioreactor. I like that one right there. And in the bioreactor is kind of where the actual magic happens, where the actual convert chemical conversion of uh, cellulose into ethanol happens. Um, that can be basically broken down into two parts. For sacrification, which is the breakdown of cellulose into glucose, and the second is fermentation, which is the conversion of glucose into ethanol. Uh, both of these are enzymatic processes, so theoretically, we could um, acquire the enzymes necessary and have it done in vitro, but it would just be far more effective uh, to have a cell, or a cell like uh, these three right here do the work for us. And so out of these three uh, cell lines, the first one, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, is the most commonly used in industry. It actually has the nickname Brewer's Yeast, so it's very well established for fermentation usages, and so that's what we're going to be using. Uh, just diving a little more into the biochemical details of this step, um, since this is kind of where the, or it's kind of the core of the process, uh, if we are able to uh, improve or optimize any of these smaller steps, we can really have a better process overall. And so again, saccharification is the breakdown of a polysaccharide, such as cellulose, uh, into smaller sugars, such as glucose. And so this here is the structure of cellulose. Uh, it's a bunch of repeating glucose units. Uh, it's found in plant cells you know, abundantly, especially in the context of cell strength, so cell walls. So you might be able to imagine that in orange peels, there is a lot of cellulose. Um, and the way it's broken down is first cellulase breaks it down to these disaccharides, cellulose. And then that final glycosylic bond is cleaved by beta-glucosidase in a hydrolytic reaction to generate two uh, glucoses. What's noteworthy with this is that cellulose, the intermediate, is actually an inhibit, or it inhibits cellulose activity. So by enhancing beta-glucosidase uh, activity overall, we can kind of drive the reaction in that direction and increase our yield. Um, that can be done either through genetic engineering or by adding uh, beta-glucosidase on the side. Uh, after that, we can ferment the glucose into ethanol, so that also has two uh, main parts. First is glycolysis, which is the breakdown of uh, glucose into two pyruvate molecules. In red are all the major enzymes that are involved. I'm not going to go through all the details because that's way too mundane, but 
Essentially, uh, pyruvate is a three molecule, a uh, three carbon molecule, and it's a major intermediate in a lot of biochemical pathways. Um, so here, it's, that's why it's important that we have yeast in an anaerobic conditions, because then that facilitates uh, that fermentation to ethanol instead of say lactic acid fermentation. And so again, pyruvate has three carbons. One is removed as carbon dioxide, yielding acetaldehyde, uh, and that can get converted into ethanol as our product. However, um, other than glucose and cellulose, heavy cellulose is also present in orange peels in a significant amount. And the difference there is that heavy cellulose, in addition to glucose, has other sugars, so such as uh, xylose. And you can see here that xylose and glucose, the major difference is that xylose doesn't have the methoxy group coming off, so there's one less carbon, so five carbon sugar, pentose. And you can imagine the problem is that if you only have five carbons, you can't make two pyruvates out of that. So naturally, yeast is unable to ferment this. However, um, through genetic engineering, you can express these two enzymes, uh, XR and XDH, xylose uh, reductase and xylotodehydrogenase. And by doing that, uh, yeast can utilize this pathway to convert xylose into xylulose. And then from xylulose, it can enter the pentose phosphate pathway, which yeast can naturally um, utilize as well. And so by doing that, we are able to uh, generate ethanol from both glucose and xylose, and through that we were able to increase the yield by a significant amount. So now that we have ethanol, whether it's from glucose, xylose, or another source, uh, it needs to be concentrated and purified. And so the first step in that is distillation. Um, in a distillation column, the mixture is boiled and condensed repeatedly in cycles, and since ethanol has a uh, rather low boiling point, especially compared to water, it's more volatile compound, and so in each cycle, its composition will increase uh, as you go up the trays. And eventually, you'll, uh, we can pull it off our, our distillate. A uh, number of trays can be optimized using the cave theory plot. Uh, so it's just using uh, vapor liquid equilibrium data, as well as knowing the inlet feed composition. So I think in this example, it's about 40% ethanol. Um, and then just for this particular system, the viscosity of the mixture coming in has to be taken into consideration since it's rather high. Uh, and that was a factor in the design of the actual trays as well as the distance between the trays. So theoretically, uh, you can reach essentially pure ethanol with just distillation, but there is a point where uh, adding more trays simply isn't very effective, both in terms of cost and as well as efficiency. And so our final step to reach that um, pure ethanol instead is our molecular soap and drying unit. Uh, and the way this works is it operates on two major principles. One, that ethanol and water have different sizes uh, in terms of their molecules. And then also that uh, they have differences in absorptivity um, properties. And so the way this works is that we have a sieve with uh, absorbing beads on it, and water is drawn out. That's why it's called drying or dehydration. Well, ethanol passes through cleanly, and so we are able to recover uh, basically field-grade ethanol as our final. So now I'm going to be talking a little bit about the key equipment that we have in um, both of the plants. Um, so for our um, pilot scale plant, plant A, um, we really have three pieces of equipment um, that are main, um, and it's the jet cooker, um, the distillation column, and then the fermentation tanks. Um, so for the jet cooker, we will be buying it from Zhejiang um, Machinery Co., um, whereas the distillation column will be bought from um, Fei Chung. Um, machinery Co. Um, and finally, the two uh, tank fermentation tanks, um, we plan on buying them from um, Rulin Engineering and uh, Consulting. Um, and then looking at our plant B, which is our commercial scale plant, here we have some more details on, um, you know, more, uh, more because it's a larger process, um, it's more scaled up, we have more um, equipment for this one. Um, again, we have the jet cooker, um, and then we have the lemony column, the um, fermentation tanks, and the distillation column, and then finally, like Joseph said, um, the uh, drying um, molecular sieve system. Um, and for this one, because it's more scaled up, we plan buying the jet cooker from QJet. Um, the distillation column will be bought from um, Letta, and the dryer will be bought from um, Wintech. So, Talking a little bit more now, we're shifting over towards like the business side, um, and let's uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about the process specifications. Now, if there's one thing 
you should take away from this presentation, one magic little number that we kind of have memorized and it's kind of scary, I want you to know it is that our process converts about 1,000 kilograms of orange peel waste to about nine gallons of ethanol. Um, and we will be requiring about 56 million gallons of orange peel waste per year. I know that seems like a lot of orange peel waste. However, the amount of orange peel waste generated worldwide is in terms of millions of tons. So there it's, I believe it's 60 million tons. We're only using 56 million kilograms, which is not even, we're not even putting a dent um, in worldwide supplies. So we're not really worried about running out of raw material. Um, and so, Another uh, aspect is that this is a two-day process. So right here we have our schedule. So this um, diagram right here shows our two-day process from beginning to end and the amount of time it takes for each step to happen. Um, and then right here we have our yearly schedule that we built. Uh, we plan on running our plant for about 24 um, weeks straight starting in uh, January going all the way to July. After that, we will have a two-week downtime maintenance period where you know, if anything's broken or anything needs to be upgraded, that's when we will be doing that. Um, and then we will be up and running all the way until um, the end of December where we will again have um, a two-week period where we um, again do maintenance. Um, so that's uh, the way we plan on running our entire um, process. So next you're probably wondering, after all that chemistry, where is the money? Um, so what I will be doing is walking you through some of the economic analysis that our group performed on both of our plants. First, I will be talking to you about plant A, which is the smaller one, our pilot scale plant. Um, something that we sort of looked into in terms of the market is that there is a very huge fluctuation in the price per gallon of ethanol that's being sold on the market and also per pound of the D-lemonine byproduct that is being sold. And due to that, we wanted to capture a bigger sort of scope of how the market sort of looks like and whether or not we will be generating profit. So in our first scenario, as you can see over here, I don't want to use this, I might not get the laser right, but um, what you can see right over here is um, the first um, scenario that we are presenting to you is um, under the assumption that we have maximum revenue for both of our products. So. Um, we will be selling our ethanol at the highest price um, so far that we've seen in the year, and also our delimiting by product stream will also be sold at the highest price. Um, we are also assuming in this um, scenario one that we are achieving maximum conversion in our fermentation system, which is why, as you can see, we come up to about a net margin of a little bit over 100,000 um, for the first year. Um, we then took our scenarios and laid it out in scenario two, three, and four. And in each of those scenarios, what is sort of different is um, for scenario two, we assume that we are getting the minimum price for our byproducts, but at a maximum yield. So we're getting all of our products, but not selling them at the price we want. Um, in scenario three, we are getting the maximum price for our byproducts, but we're making our minimum yield. And the last one is our worst case scenario, which we hope will not happen, is that we're not only selling our byproducts at a very low price, but we're also having a problem and um, our yield so that it's very, very low. And as you can see in our last three scenarios, we're at a net negative, um, which is something that we are trying to minimize. Um, however, as you can see, if this process is sort of proven to work on this pilot scale um, and under the right economic sort of conditions in the market, um, we do make a net profit. So moving on, I want to talk to you a little bit about the bigger plant that we plan on having. Um, Actually, I'm going to go back one more slide. Um, something to note in the capital cost for the um, smaller plant is that we had our capital cost at a one-time sort of upfront cost of about $400,000. And the reason why it's only a one-time cost and we're not splitting it over um, the duration of 10 years is because of the funding that Amar talked about in Florida that um, is sort of being given out by the government and Florida as well, which is why we assume that our first, uh, our cost for this really small plant is going to be funded by uh, these grants. But then moving forward to our plant B, which is the bigger of our plant, um, if you take a look at our capital cost, um, it is about $31 million. So we are not assuming in this scenario that we'll be getting any sort of funding. Um, so we, we accounted for that capital cost in our um, cost like sort of estimate. 
and we did two scenarios for our bigger plant and as you can see under the same like ideal conditions uh, with the best scenario we have a net margin of about 14 million dollars but if the market sort of goes down and we're not converting our um, you know converting into a lot of ethanol in that process and also we're not selling our um, products at the highest amount of money we are going to be at a net negative about negative uh, 38 million dollars Thus, as you can see, the conversion that we sort of get in our process is of utmost importance because once our yield sort of goes down, it sort of brings down our ability to sort of make money in this process. But as you can see, this process is very feasible because under really um, good conditions, we do make about $14 million. And as we've said, we're only sort of hitting a tiny portion of the orange peel waste in Florida. So we're mainly working with one company. So once this technology is sort of proven to work, we are planning to scale up even more so that we can sort of capture more of the market and sort of get a bigger piece of the pie. Um, taking sort of our best case scenario, we were able to do um, a more in-depth economic analysis. Um, we filled out um, the charts for our product revenue and also um, our ISBL cost, which is about $31 million, like I said, of our plant. From that, um, we estimated OSBL at about 40%, and um, engineering costs and contingency would be roughly about 10% of ISBL. And using that, we have an average cash flow of about $12.2 million and a simple payback period of about 4.5 years. Um, as you can see, our return on investment over the course of 10 years is rather low on the 12% side of things, but as we sort of said before, um, this is really a proof of concept sort of pilot plan. And once um, we're not you know, turning negative, at least we're sort of breaking even and making a little bit of a profit, this is a green light for us to push up and sort of increase our uh, production size and have it more industrial scale. Um, from that, you can see this is our cash flow diagram that we used the numbers from our previous slide to sort of um, have you guys sort of visualize that the first two years when we're building our plant, it is a negative cash flow because we're sort of using our money to build our plant. But right after that, in our third year, when our plant is sort of up and running, there is um, a net positive cash flow. So other than us being a very green company trying to provide an alternative source um, of energy for um, the world, we also know that safety is one of our top priorities in our plant. Uh, we want to ensure that all of our workers are properly trained. Uh, we're following all of OSHA's guidelines in terms of um, you know, no, any noise, disturbances, that our workers aren't having any long-term effects due to that. Um, all of our equipment will be properly um, checked regularly, thus we have maintenance um, yearly to sort of have that be put in place and proper process control in order to sort of shut off any equipment malfunction. Um, so that is something that our company will take pride in. Safety is our number one priority. And next, uh, because we will be generating some hazardous waste, we want to ensure that everything is sort of properly treated before we send it to a landfill. And because um, in the process we do generate a little bit of air and greenhouse emissions, and because we're a green company, we will make sure that we filter all of those emissions before it's released into the atmosphere. And lastly, because our workers are sort of handling a lot of different equipment and possibly um, ethanol and sulfuric acid at times, they will be wearing safety goggles, um, glasses, and steel toe shoes, and so that they're properly sort of safe when they're working in our plant. Because our plant has a couple of different processes, uh, sort of different parts going into it, uh, we performed a hazard and operability study on five different sort of parts of our um, process and we are going to present to you three of the most important ones that we sort of think if there is something to sort of deviate from the ideal conditions or the ideal operating um, process that the consequences would be um, great so that we need to sort of mitigate and take action before that actually happens. Um, so like Joseph said, um, sort of the first stream we're going to take a look at is the stream of the lemonine coming out of the jet cooker. Uh, because Joseph said, and this is like sort of the preventing step in, in, in us trying to get um, the fermentation step. So if, for example, that we have all of the D-lemonine staying in our jet cooker, that not only like gets transferred down to our next process, but it sort of prevents fermentation from happening, uh, which is something that we're going to take extra precautions to uh, prevent from happening. 
The next sort of um, node we looked into was the flow of sulfuric acid into our jet cooker. Um, this step, like Joseph said, is sort of helps break down the orange peels. Um, so it allows for better fermentation. And as I've mentioned in our economic analysis, we need our uh, fermentation to sort of be operating at very ideal conditions so that we are um, turning out a net profit. So we ideally would not want you know, less flow or no sulfuric acid being put into our system. And sort of the last step, which is a really crucial step, is the yeast that, uh, sort of those like, microorganisms that Joseph mentioned. They kind of work the magic in our fermentation system. So if we don't have any of that yeast in our system, that sort of means that we don't have any ethanol being produced. And all of those sort of net negative like economic analysis will surely happen, and we do not want that, which is why extra sort of actions will be taking place in order for us to ensure that everything is sort of going to work um, in our process. Sort of the last thing we also took a look at um, is to sort of analyze the different components in our process and sort of see if these components were to fail, how like detrimental would that be for us? And in this, each of our process or each step is sort of um, rated in three different ca categories. So the severity of um, the disruption and how likely is this disruption supposed to happen and sort of what is the probability that we would be able to detect the problem? And in each category, you're sort of scored, and once those are sort of multiplied together, um, those that have an overall risk probability of over 100, um, you sort of need to take action before um, you sort of like start making your plan, or th these are things that you should look for as you're designing your plan. So as you can see, um, fermentation scored 120. So some of the actions that we're going to take um, is that we're going to make sure that we're sort of controlling everything because that's sort of our major step. Um, we don't want that to fail because if that fails, like I said, we will not be baking ethanol and we will not like that. So um, we've talked about the science, we've talked about the business, now we're going to talk a little bit about some recommendations. Um, so one of the things is, like Amy said, our economics is a little bit dependent on us making a lot of um, ethanol. So one of the things that we need to do is we need to make sure that we are staying on the cutting edge of any new technology that's coming out. Um, right now, we are expecting yields from 30 to about 45 um, liters. Um, but there is ongoing research that's showing that you can make up to 60 liters of ethanol. And so we need to make sure that if anything comes out that increases our yield, we implement that into our process right away. Um, and then another thing that we could do is we could sort of restructure ourselves as a subsidiary to a major um, you know, company that exists out there already because that will help us sort of weather out more of the economic turmoil that's going on um, and you know, hopefully we can be successful in that. And then finally, um, our process is not limited to simply orange peel waste. It's just the one thing that we chose because it generates the most ethanol. We can use this for theoretically for any other fruit waste. So tangerines, you know, grapefruit. We can even use it for apples and bananas. Um, and one of the things is once we've proven that it's worked for orange peels, we plan on expanding out into other fruit waste, other agriculture waste, because right now it's not even being utilized. So we plan on utilizing that and generating something beneficial from that. So sort of looking forward, um, we've shown that ethanol production from orange peel um, waste has the potential to draw down our reliance on corn-based ethanol, um, and it can also sort of reduce our reliance on non-renewable um, energy resources. And furthermore, this does not require any extra cultivation. We're not actually going out there and planting any more uh, orange groves. We're actually just taking waste and turning that into something useful. Um, and so that's why we're also, like we said earlier, we are um, meeting green energy requirements. So looking forward, we plan on securing funding and approval for our process. We we want to talk to investors, um, some funds, and see where we can um, talk to the government as well, see where we can go for that. Um, and then after that, we will break ground on our plant in Florida. And in about two years, we plan on beginning production, um, where we will assess our viability, see how things are actually turning out to be, um, and we'll take it from there. So in conclusion, um, there is ripe potential in our market. Like I mentioned earlier on, there's about 10 billion gallons plus um, that demand that needs to be met. Um, so initially we will target about half a million gallons um, in our pilot plant scale. Um, 
and in there we expect to generate about $100,000 plus profit um, under favorable circumstances. Um, and expanding to the commercial scale, we have seen that it is economic viable. It's a lot more. Uh, we, plan, we stand to make a lot more money on the commercial scale. So we hope that we can expand to that after we prove ourselves um, at the pilot plant level. And then looking at all of the EHNS and any um, safety regulations, we have mitigated um, and we've identified all the steps that we believe could be harmful to our operators. Um, and we've mitigated them to reduce the risk that they face um, while operating. So we'd just like to thank um, our pen, uh, mentor, Paul. He's been a really great guy. He's always there for us. You know, we can reach out to him and he's talked to us a lot about the economics of this project to make sure that it stays viable. Um, and then we'd also like to thank Professor Webster and Professor Shi um, for their continued guidance throughout the entire semester. Um, they let us know what we needed to work on. They let us know what steps we needed, and you know, it's been it's been really helpful. Um, from this. Oh, and as, sorry, Donwood as well. Um, he's been uh, helpful in helping us connect to our mentor. Um, and then, last but not least, the Northeastern Chemical Engineering Department. We've been here for five years now, um, and we have learned a lot. Um, hopefully, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> <laughs> so we're hoping to get an A in this class. <laughs> wink, wink, nudge, nudge. But no, um, in all honesty, it has been um, a pleasure. Um, sometimes it's been tough. Sometimes it's been like, what am I doing? But um, it has been a great pleasure being here. And we want to thank you all for letting us here. Questions? We do have time for a couple of quick questions. Yeah, Don. What was the logic for sizing a pilot plant? So, you um, so we looked at other uh, pilot plants that exist in the field already, um, and we looked at how uh, what their level of production is, and we wanted to base our level of production at a similar level to that, um, and so that's why we chose five hundred thousand dollars because there's already plants existing. Uh, they're not necessarily um, orange peel waste plants, but they are like corn based, and they're at three hundred thousand, four hundred thousand. And we believe that that is an adequate level to sort of um, see if our process is working at a higher than lab scale process um, level. So that's why we chose that. Um, and, and I heard two, two hypotheses about the orange pill availability. One was that there was, there was a lot in the world. And the other seems to infer that there's enough in Florida to drive your facility. Yes. Did you um, know that? Yes, um, so we're mainly targeting one of the main sort of orange juice um, producing companies in Florida um, and they have 6,000 acres of land that they're sort of growing oranges on and for our initial like um, 500 gallon plant we plan on partnering up with them to sort of get our initial batch from there. But once sort of that's working we're going to expand out to the rest of um, Florida. So like Minute Maid, Tropicana, we haven't um, sort of looked more in depth into that, but we know that they're major players um, in terms of the well, orange juice. Well, there's a lot of orange juice. They don't necessarily grow a lot of orange Yeah, but um, there are uh, juice manufacturers there as well. And the reason we're talking about the rest of the world is that eventually we expect to extinguish, sort of like, not extinguish, but utilize the maximum supply for, of raw materials from Florida, after which we'll need to sort of look elsewhere. This is something that's sort of farther down the line. It's just something that we're taking into account right now so that we don't say, oh, well, we're out of how many orange peels we can use, so what do we do now? So it's just something farther down the line where we say, yes, we will have continued uh, raw material uh, being supplied to us. The number is something like 21 teragrams. Well, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know. I, I didn't hear closure on it. That's why I asked. Uh, yeah. So there, is a, there are a lot but of But Brazil, Brazil is a right. exactly. major supplement yeah. of, things. of our issues. Here and I, my guess is they don't ship oranges because you're shipping a lot of air. Yeah. So they probably should be concentrate, and if that's the case, the peels are in Brazil. And mm -hmm. They're not, you know, they're not Florida. Yeah. Can you get cellulase activity from wild type Baker's yeast? What? Sorry. Can you get cellulase activity from wild type Baker's yeast? Yeah. No. So the whole cellulose um, sacrification process is natural and does happen. Uh, just with yeast. In so two two quick questions, which I, I'm pretty sure we've talked about this throughout the semester. So insecticides, mm -hmm. is this 
you know, how is it the sulfuric acid that will, how will you clean the peels from insecticides? Well, that's, um, that's why we have our washing and slicing step right there mm -hmm. in the beginning so that we can clear out um, any insecticides that are on top of the peels. And we also expect that when we are receiving these peels, um, the juice manufacturers will have cleaned them because they, they use them to make juice as well. They might not use the peel waste right there, but we expect them to have a certain level of cleanliness. Um, and we're just using our pre-treatment, uh, our washing and slicing stuff mm -hmm. as an extra measure yeah. on top mm -hmm. of that. So that's why. Um, so is that what the, the peels are, do they go to landfill? Or, um, so uh, what typically happens with the orange peel waste is that um, they can't immediately put it into the landfill because it, um, there's a lot of sort of environmental factors that go into like it just sitting in the landfill and probably generating like um, off gas. Um, but what they do is they turn it into cattle feed pellets. And what they do with that is they sort of feed it to the cattle. Um, the reason why we're providing an alternative to that is because it's very energy intensive to make this cattle pellet. The amount of energy and money you put into making it, the price that you sort of sell it back at is almost even. So they basically break even by just making okay. them into pellets. But that does make sense why you are buying the peels from them yeah. rather than it being given to you mm -hmm. uh, if they were just going to pay for it to yeah. go into the landfill or, or some other expense. Yeah, yeah. They, don't, okay. they don't have to like do anything special to it to yeah. give it to us, whereas for the cattle feed, they're, they do. They're, they, they do. do, so we're giving them a lot of money actually at this case. Uh, Excellent. We're buying them. Yeah. Buying All right, so in the interest of time, mm -hmm. thank you guys very much. Yeah. Very nice.